When someone begins to see the biblical plan of salvation in its entirety, the question frequently comes up, are you saying I must be baptized to be saved? It's a great question, but it's also a loaded question. If the answer is yes, we often begin to think about all the people we know who were never baptized. So many of them are, or were, really devout believers. We think about our parents, our friends. We think about old Aunt Katie, who never missed a day of church in her life. How could they be lost? Is God really that narrow in his thinking? We'll talk about that in a moment. If I say no, it pretty much ignores everything that we've just studied. So let's use a little logic once again. I want you to decide this issue for yourself. Are you ready? Okay. Is water baptism a command of Christ? Can you be saved if you refuse to obey him? This is not hard, is it? It's hard to accept, but not hard to understand. We could really use just a little more help here. Let's get a solid answer from Jesus himself. Grab your Bible and carefully read both chapters of John 14 and 15. Pause the video if you'd like, or just listen to this convicting excerpt. John 14, verse 23 and 24. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. In these scriptures, Jesus declares, if we love him, we will obey him. And when we obey him, we receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is tough, but a lack of obedience is a clear confirmation that we do not love Christ. We cannot be a servant of Christ and not obey him. Once again, if you have sincere questions about this issue, there is a study available which may be of help, but look for it at the index at www.faiththatobeys.org. Okay, let's finish our review and then have a serious talk. One of the scriptures that we used several times in our studies is Matthew 7.21. Let's look at it one more time, but this time go just a little bit deeper. Matthew 7.21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. In light of everything that we've studied, this is about to become an absolutely stunning passage of scripture. Watch. If we were to express this in modern terms, this passage would read, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is a Christian. Jesus explains many of these sincere, dedicated people prophesied, drove out demons, and did many miracles. He does not deny these things were really happening. And he tells us many people will find themselves in this tragic position. It's not a few who are lost. Many are lost. In the stunning conclusion, Jesus completely rejects these devoted, sincere people. But why is he rejecting them? It would have to be for one of three reasons. Was it because he at one time knew them and they had turned away from him? No. Did they not know him? No. These very sincere, very committed, hard-working believers knew Christ intimately. That wasn't the problem. The problem was Christ never knew them. These people were really doing amazing, wonderful things for Jesus, yet sadly, they were deceived. Somehow, somewhere, sometime, they had deviated from the narrow road. They knew Jesus very well and were willing to do great things for him, but were sidetracked at a very critical and specific point in time. That time was before he ever knew them. Whatever they did to begin the relationship with Jesus was ineffective. Today, these people would confidently call themselves Christians and point to their spiritual deeds and righteous living as proof. All of their deeds and devotions serve as confirmation of their good relationship with Christ. Now, please listen carefully. This is chilling. The modern plan of salvation 
is the same sort of scheme which trapped these sincere people. The modern plan presents Jesus accurately, offers salvation, and invites people to make a life commitment to Christ, but only in a way which is empty and ineffective. Today, people are deviated from the biblical plan right before Jesus ever knows them as his obedient servant. Jesus even concludes with the exact same conclusion we've arrived at. He told them clearly what the problem was. They had not done the will of the Father. If they had obeyed him, he would have known them. He promised it in John 14. What do you suppose was the reaction when Jesus said, Away from me, you evildoers? Do you think any of them stopped and, and humbly asked, Lord, thank you for correcting me. What do I need to do? Like them, we have a choice to continue blindly in the familiar or be open to the possibility that we've been wrong and be willing to change. Now, if you're like me, you struggle very deeply with the idea that so many people could be lost. How can this be? Is God that strict? Is the way really that narrow? Once again, Jesus gives us the answer. Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. In Jesus' illustration, there are two roads and two gates. Both are clearly marked, this is the road to heaven. Only one is correct. Jesus doesn't say a few will find the small gate and narrow road. He says only a few. The way to salvation is extremely narrow. I'll never forget the moment I realized how narrow the road to heaven actually is. When I raised this issue with the man who studied the Bible with me, he asked, would you like to see exactly how narrow the road is? Would that be helpful? I was like, absolutely. I, anything to help, you know? Then, raising his Bible and showing me the spine, he said, this narrow. Remember when I said people don't bother to check out what their pastor or priest tells them? They should be checking it out in the Bible. Do you understand? This is the greatest responsibility of your life. You must know what is in this book. This is the final exam, and it's an open book test. There's absolutely nothing more important than us knowing the scriptures. And, and, and don't say the Bible's too hard to understand. God didn't graciously give us a savior and then send us a book which was so hard to understand that nobody could figure out how to get to the savior. Get some help. One person teaches another person. The Bible's easy to understand if we have the heart of a child. Sure, there are things which are difficult to accept. And you know what? They should be. God is choosing a bride for his son. He has a right to have some strict filters on who he allows in. In my view, it appears that humility is probably at the top of his list. I think this is why scriptures say only a few will be saved. Now the question is, are we part of that few? Don't you want to do everything possible to make sure you're doing the will of God according to the scriptures? What do you have to lose? What's worth holding on to? Your pride? Your spiritual resume? It's time to make some radical new changes in your life. Are you ready? Now, by the way, it's not going to be without hardships. The evangelical world rages against this truth. You may have felt some pretty strong emotions yourself as we've gone through these lessons. The biblical plan of salvation challenges the status quo and trashes the traditions, which are the pylons of denominationalism and the modern evangelical doctrine. Well, we're almost finished. The question now remains, what should we do with this really old information?